Hi everyone, Dom Femularo back again, the artist series at a distance. I am having so much fun because I have got two massive legends in front of me that I'm going to pull information out of. Uh, guys, I want to hear your story. Would you please welcome Mr. Kelvin Holly and David Hood? Hello. Hello out there. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for joining me here. This is so fantastic. I mean, you guys have a story individually and collectively that I think is so magical and so important in music history, in, in what we have in, in modern music. I mean, you guys really have played with all of these great players, but we go back to Muscle Shoals, this area that is just so rich in history in the music industry. So if I could start working with Calvin first. Calvin, tell me a little bit about your story about kind of where you came from and how you got involved in playing music. I grew up in a military family, first of all. Uh, however, we were, uh, my dad was stationed outside of Nashville when I was young. And we were stationed there for a long time. A little town called Smyrna, Murfreesboro, just south of Nashville. But then when I was like, uh, I guess, 10 years old, of course, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and I immediately knew what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I already knew a few chords on the guitar. But anyway, uh, dad got stationed to Izmir, Turkey. So we immediately, we lived in Izmir, Turkey for two years. That's where I really started. I'd go to the post exchange and buy all the new releases, you know, the Beatles, Hendrix, just sit there with the record player moving the arm back and forth, you know, just listening, see if I could imitate the lick, you know. That's where it all started for me. So, Kelvin, what was it about? Because the Beatles in that February 9th, 1964 performance on the Ed Sullivan Show, when that hit, it really spawned hundreds of thousands of musicians, including myself. Oh, it was very, I mean, everybody uh, the next day of school was ready to start a band. Hey, yeah. man, you want to start a band? I'm like, yeah, I got my dad's got a garage, you know, and. Yeah, I was, that's where it all started. And it was just, you know, the camaraderie. You became best friends with these people, you know, and you shared common interests, you know. But I remember hearing John Lennon talk about uh, seeing Elvis for the first time in film. And, and we, they were sitting there going, that's a good job, <laughs> you know. So it was kind of the same, the same thing. You're like, wow, they're playing their own songs. They look great. They got the suits on. That, you know, they write their own stuff. What a magical time for sure. Absolutely incredible. David, what sparked you? What got you got involved in, in playing, in playing, you know, bass and having your involvement in music? I started going to see bands, I guess, when I was in early high school, 15 years old. I saw my first electric bass when I was about 15 years old. I, I've been watching the band and I noticed that one of the guitars was bigger than the other one. And I didn't know there was a such thing as an electric bass. And uh, I started watching and thought, boom, 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 what's making that noise? And I would watch and realize that there was one of them bigger and had four knobs on it. And uh, I, I didn't necessarily want to be a bass player, but uh, all the guitar players I knew were a whole lot better than me. So I thought, well, maybe I sh I'll get a bass. So I, I had a friend whose father fixed TVs and radios in their kitchen at night. And he printed up some stationery, and we ordered straight from Fender a Fender Jazz Master and a Fender Jazz Bass. And I had the first jazz bass in town. And uh, uh, I went from there. You know, I, I started learning songs, and I picked it up pretty quickly. I started playing bass at 18, and by 23, I played on some gold records. So how, how did you learn? I mean, how did you learn the instrument to understand theory and notes? Where did that all come from? I, I, I listened to a lot of music and uh, I played the trombone in the school band before the, the, the bass. And so I was a little familiar with bass clef, and, but I, I just listened a lot. Uh, I, I, I picked it up pretty quickly, really. It was the, like in the head, I got it really quickly in my hands. It was, took a little more time. <laughs> So was it was it listening to the radio? Were, it, were there albums? You know, were you purchasing Album. albums? And uh, and also watching other bands. I I learned uh, about Ray Charles and Jimmy Reed and Chuck Berry from watching other bands. And then I would after I heard them play it, I'd go find the record of these people and I'd learn it from the records. So you're pulling all this material. You're learning your your instrument, Kelvin. What happened with your with some of the first bands you started playing with? 
We broke up. <laughs> <laughs> when when we got to Turkey, of course, you moved to a new country, a foreign country. You don't know anybody. Yeah. And then your first day at school, you know, you usually start meeting people. And eventually you meet like-minded people. Yeah. Hey, let's start a band, you know. Okay, great. And then you start playing. That's, to me, is how you really start how to learn, you know. Practicing in your bedroom is one thing, but playing with other playing people, with other people is, the big is, is, is like going, it's better than going to school in a, a lot of ways, you know. But uh, that's that's pretty much how it started. And then, of course, we left Turkey and then we moved to my mom's hometown of Munich, Germany. OK, and then I didn't know anybody again. So I had to start all over, you know, and then I, we repeated it when we moved to Alabama, but way back 1970. Meet like-minded people, start a band. I had, a, at the time, got an offer with, at the time, was like the most popular band in Montgomery, Alabama, you know. And I had every intention of trying to go to college and everything. I just chucked it all out the window. And I left home on my 18th birthday and got in the back of a van, you know. So What what courage? What what do you think drew Yeah, what, yeah. it's like Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was that? I mean, yeah, you, you, you know, I mean, it really is something had to fuel you to say, "I'm doing this for the rest." Well, it was of the life. passion for playing. I mean, I just it was it just felt natural. It felt like a part of me. I was just following the muse, you know. So. Yeah, in in my case, my father had a tire store, and he wanted me to follow in the business with him, and I did. I worked with him from age fifteen or so till I quit when I went music full time. Uh, I just, I'm, I had more fun playing music than I did working in the tire store and, uh, and I made better money right off. Yeah. The, I was the boss's son and yeah. I could make more money in a day uh, playing music than I could in a week working in the tire store. Well, they really were different times years ago in, in what was offered and how music was played and how much demand there was for live music. Yeah. 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 And it was it, live music was a lot of fun, but when I got in the studio, it was really hit. When I first time I heard myself on the radio, I said, "Man, that, now that's what I want to do." You get you do that and get paid for it too. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's let's talk about that. We're, we, you had some professional gigs before before you got into the recording studio, so you were now playing. Were you touring? No, it was frat parties, weekend gigs, and things for me just on the weekends and working at the tire store during the week. But I started doing some recording sessions with Rick Hall and Quinn Ivey, uh, uh, Percy Sledge at, a, at Fame and at Quinn Ivey's studio. And a, in a day I could make more money than I, you know, a whole week in, in, in the tire store. And so after a while I had to go tell my father that I'm not going to go into the business with you. And it broke his heart. He said, son, you're going to be, playing with drug addicts and, and, and everything. You know, it's just, he just, yeah, the scum of the earth. And he was right. But I, I've, <laughs> I've loved every minute of it. He was right. <laughs> so, Kelvin, how did it work for you? You, you start playing, you, you come back to the States, and you're meeting other musicians. And, again, those like-minded musicians. Right. Meeting with them, you're getting together, you're putting bands together, and you're playing. Right. That, that's exactly right. I mean, it's like I got in the van – and I stayed in there for like 20 years. I just, I played every place in America with who, whatever band at the time. Some of them I was with for a long time, but we were doing the circuit as they called it back then. You know, you could go from town to town, state to state. You could go play two, three nights a week, stay there for a week, go somewhere else to follow. And that's what I did, you know, and I eventually got tired of it, you know, so so when did the recording industry start to step into your world? After I did The Road Forever, I ended up in a band called The Decoys. It was founded by Johnny Sandlin, who was the producer at Capricorn Records in Macon, Georgia. He produced the Allman Brothers and whoever else was on Capricorn at the time. You know, I, I knew who he was. I had no idea he was from Alabama. And I just got a call from him one day, said he had a band called the Decoys. Would I be interested in coming to check them out? So I went and jammed with them, started playing with them. And I'm still, everybody, a lot of people have passed on, uh, but we still have the band. I was, I was even a decoy. David was a long time. He, yeah, he hadn't played live since the traffic when they were with traffic. 
Yeah. And they would come see us play or whatever. But we finally managed to get him and Roger up to play with us. And Dave has been with us pretty much ever since, yeah. you know. That was almost 30 years ago or 25. Well, it seemed like it was like about 1991 around that time. Somewhere. Well, that's when I joined the band. I joined the decoys. In, but it wasn't long after. It was early 90s. But uh, at one time, we had David and Roger playing with us. That was a hell of a rhythm section. Uh, you know, Roger is just a as a drummer, you know, following Roger's career and just being able to be influenced by his playing. I mean, what a deep groove and just so many great things that Roger has done also. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's not doing well physically, health wise. Yeah. And I don't know how much longer we'll have him now. I talk to him regularly. But uh, Roger was he he played. He, he was playing on the, my first recording session which was May 15th, 1966, that I, first time I made Union Scale. And uh, that was Percy Sledge, Warm and Tender Love. And after that, it, that was a gold record. And after that, my phone started ringing. And so I started having to learn how to play. <laughs> Other than cover stuff, you know, I always before it was cover stuff. And after that session, I started ha having to learn how to play what you play on a recording session. Uh, you know, I had to learn what choruses and verses were. <laughs> Talk about that. In the recording studio, you get there in the beginning stages, and the recording industry has dramatically changed from that time. Yeah. So at that time, what was it like? You get in the studio, you're all in the same room together, basically, and you're just discussing the rundown of the tune. Yeah, and we early on, I, I was fortunate enough to work with Roger and first Spooner Oldham, then uh, Barry Beckett, and Jimmy Johnson, and countless guitar players, uh, Eddie Hinton. And Dwayne Allen, some of those guys. Or, but we would uh, we we learned how to make chord charts, number charts, and we got really good at it. So we could do we could cut song an hour, you know, a, ba a basic track, really good every hour. And uh, and so we were we were bargaining. First, we started charging. Uh, we played. Uh, we did Union Scale, but we worked twice as long for the three hour session today. Uh, to get people to come work with us, and pretty soon we were, they were selling so many records that we were able to just go to the record three hour sessions. And after that, I started doing double scale stuff. So at a young age, you're starting to record. You're getting a taste for this industry, Kelvin. What was it like for you when you started recording and hearing yourself back on on the recordings? That was scary. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just one of those that I feel like anytime I play something and it ends up on the record, I, I'm always going, man, I shouldn't have played that. I could have, done, I could have played a better part or whatever, you know, but it, it was great. And my first studio experience really was when I first moved here. They used to come see us. Jimmy Johnson came one night. Roger would come. Roger would come. But uh, Jimmy came up to me. I never met him. knew who he was. But he came up to me on a break and said, uh, so-and-so told me that I should come see you play. You know, said, well, great, man. It's great to, you know, and he was very complimentary and said that they were getting ready to go to uh, Jackson, Mississippi to do Bobby Blue Blaine's record, right? Yeah. He said, how would you like to come down there and play on it? And I'm like a huge fan of the Swampers, number one, but I was a, a big fan of Bobby Bland. I said, what time are we leaving? You know. <laughs> so that was really my first taste of being in session world because, yeah, you know, I never aspired to be a studio musician. I always felt like, well, if somebody likes the way I play and they call me, that's great. It's amazing. Did you organize yourselves mapping things out or was this just stuff coming at you from all different angles? My rhythm section, we were pretty organized, we were pretty straight, no drinking or any kind of stuff, crazy stuff on the session. And uh, we, 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 since it was the same group of guys most of the time, we said, look, we, and we bought a studio. That was the deal. We bought our own studio. And so we knew, with our name on the, on the contract, we knew we couldn't mess up. So we said, all right, nothing comes before this. Not wives, not girlfriends, not vacations, not anything. This is number one. And, uh, and we really were very serious about our recording. And, you know, we worked, we worked together so good as a team with the chord charts and stuff. We were, we were unbeatable for a while. 
listen, you're still unbeatable. <laughs> this, is absolute, this is still continuing at such a high level of what you're doing. So you're recording. All of a sudden now you're starting to hear yourself back on these recordings. You guys, this was like a turnstile. There were so many artists that you guys were working with at the time. This is, must have been an amazing realization of like, we're really doing this. Yeah, it was a magic time. It really yeah. was. Let's talk about Aretha Franklin. Memories that you have in working with Aretha. I mean, th this was a, an incredible talent. You know, how was she to work with? Was it a was it a, a, a you know a creative process? Were you were you nervous? What was, what was it like? Yeah, well, my first recording session with her, I was playing trombone. I was part of the horn section, and uh, Tommy Cockbill was the bass player. Great bass player, Tommy. And uh, I was so happy to be on the session. But the session during that session. Rick Hall, the producer, and Jerry Wexler, they got into a big disagreement over one of the other musicians. And so Aretha leaves. And so when Aretha leaves, they take the recording back to New York and they use New York horn players. So I don't get to go on the first after that. But I played on her first hit record, played trombone on it. I never loved a man. I never and, loved a man. That was the first one. You're on trombone. And yeah. the horn section that was there, you know, I mean, with the, with the charts, did you have to like sight read stuff? Were you able to work uh, with stuff? It was, it was head arrangements. We just made it up as we went in. And it's the same with the rhythm section. They had arrangements. But everybody was dis disciplined and together. It wasn't a wild bunch like kids rock and roll nowadays. It, we were very serious. We knew people in Nashville and, and what they were doing. Trying to be like that. Well, I'd like to have you both tap upon that about a head arrangement. You're really just depending on your ears and you're just playing what you feel at that moment. Yeah, uh, there, there's usually some guide. Either there's a demo from the songwriter or something. Uh, and and the, the producers I worked with were great. Jerry Wexler, Tom Dowd, uh, really great. And Rick is not a bad producer himself. But So there's some guide, but, but we... We sort of knew what to do. I don't know why. We just did. But well, where do you think that comes from? I mean, you know, you, you guys, you know, were, were, you, were you taking lessons at all? Were you learning no. the instrument? No. Uh, we, were, we were listening to the records. This listening is, to people's records. It's just by feel. It's just, you know, how do you describe feel? I don't know. But, you know, I know a lot of sessions David and I have been on together. You'll hear the demo of the song and you, you got your chart and you're kind of looking at it. And then, if you know, unless they have any specific direction, they kind of rely on you. I mean, if you want to go back to a lot of records, I know there's a producer on all these big hits, but I would venture to say a large percentage of those records were produced by the musician. That's hey, just it's it's osmosis at its best. It was just coming out of the air and just striking you guys big time. No way. And a lot of times, they sometimes the artist is like, wow, how'd you guys do that? You know, after one or two takes, you know. And it helps to know the guys you're playing with, too, sometimes. So all those years of touring and playing, is that, you know, that and then listening to music, that pretty much was your university. Yeah, I didn't really tour that much. I did. Uh, he did, but I didn't. I, I went straight in the studio and started having success in the studio, so there was no reason for me to tour. I'm the road guy. He's the studio guy. <laughs> well, Kevin, let's talk about the road. You went out. Who was the first act you went out with on the road? Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I was in the back of a van for 20 years, so that was the road. But uh, I guess uh, things started changing for me when I started playing with the d and working with Johnny Sandlin. Yeah. Uh, he started hiring me for a lot of his sessions. He, You know, he was a record producer. So I played on what well, Dave did, too. Uh, all the people he was working with, you know, Greg Allman being one of them. We did an album with Greg and uh, Jimmy Hall. Jimmy Hall uh, Several others, Bonnie Bramley. Bonnie, Bonnie Bramley. and then then we started playing over here a lot, and then that's where I met this guy. And then I got a call from Little Richard because some of his guys live here in town. His band asked me if I could come fly to Los Angeles the next morning. <laughs> 
But anyway, uh, yeah, I got to the airport and flew to Los Angeles, went to the riot house there on Sunset, went up to his room, and we, it was me and him, hung out for about an hour, and I played a show with, with him that night with The Temptation. And I stayed with him almost 20 years. So in learning the show and going out for that show. I never had a rehearsal. Never rehearsal. You Not went out one rehearsal you. ever. What? How'd that work so great? Where, where well, you mean, I just went out there. All I knew was everything was C, F, or G as far <laughs> as the key. And it was just basically all boogie woogie. But it was kind of, you know, you know, it's, you know, Richard stuff. So, I mean, there were some signature licks, but you just hear it, you know. He's larger than life. So, I mean, it was a great run. You know? How pretty powerful that the experiences that you guys have. I mean, I love the the documentary that was put out about Muscle Shoals. It's just a yeah. wonderful documentary. It really is beautiful to see the history captured the way it is. David, you're in the studio. You've got these great acts. You, know, you leave trombone. You're playing bass now. And you're playing these charts that you're just kind of like feeling what's happening as it's going along. You're kind of like really kind of, to a certain degree, just kind of walking on eggshells. You're not exactly sure what's going to happen, right? Right, right. And, you know, the, the biggest fear was the producer, say, uh, David, come in here, please, and fire me. <laughs> but luckily that didn't happen. And I, apparently I played the right thing. And, and a lot of these sessions are trial and error. You know, you try something, it doesn't work, you try something else. It's no, no big deal. So what was it like? I mean, you know, when I look at the list, listen, guys, both of you guys, when I look at the list here of artists, Aretha Franklin, Wilson Pickett, Otis Redding, James Brown, Clarence Carter, Etta James, David, Percy Sledge, Bob Seger, Steve Winwood, Rod Stewart, Paul Simon, Cat Stevens, uh, you know, Dwayne Allman, Linda Ronstadt, Jimmy Buffett. Willie Nelson, I mean, Boss Skaggs, Levon Helm. What was it like, David, working with Levon Helm? Oh, he's great. I love Levon. He, he and I were pretty close. I played on his at his 60th, 60th birthday, I guess, uh, right before he passed. And uh, he was, by then, he'd had cancer, throat cancer and everything. And he, he, he still, the, when he played, it was like he was 20 years old again. I mean, what a great player. Uh, Levon and I were pretty close. I got to work with Levon one time on a comedian, Tim Wilson. And it was at the uh, other muscle shows down on the river. Uh, my wife owns now. Uh, Levon had can cancer and couldn't talk, but I remember hearing him in the headphones counting it off. Like, One, two, you know. But anyway, we took a break and we we're sitting in a little, di this little dining area down there. And he looked at me and said, let's start a band. <laughs> go, go, go. I was like, yeah, let's go. But yeah, he was great. I felt like I knew him for a long time. Man. Well, nobody played drums and sang as well. That's right. That way, to have that skill. Well, he, the dude, fact that he was also a great actor, that's a whole other story about Levon, for sure. He was yeah. just always Levon, it seemed like. You know, he just only had that one persona, you know. When I look at the list for yourself, Kelvin, you know, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Neil Young, Greg Allman, Percy Sledge, Clarence Carter, Jerry Lee Lewis, Wilson Pickett, Pickett John Fogarty, the Marshall Tucker Band, the Oak Ridge Boys, I mean, uh, Ray Cyrus, Billy Ray Cyrus. I mean, it, it, there's such a wide variety of, of music that you guys must have listened to as kids to take this all in, to somewhat be prepared to handle the wide variety of artists you were recording with. Yeah, well, that, that helps. That just goes back to playing in bands and playing cover songs, you know, uh, because you, you're forced to learn that stuff. So you kind of, your palate's kind of wide range as far as... There's a lot of faking it, too. There was a lot of faking it, too. I mean, I'm not a country guitar player, but I'm on some country albums. I can make my guitar sound kind of country if I need to, you know. David, it says here you also produce songs for Willie Nelson, Cher, and some others. Yeah, that was more of a co-production deal. Uh, the, the rhythm section would co-produce with different people, Bob Seger, for instance. I still get checks from Bob, thank the Lord. Uh, but uh, we to work, to work with these people, we'd get them, we'd say, well, look, we want a production point. We'd split it between the four of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's my production mostly. I produced a few groups myself, but mainly my production experience was with the rhythm section. 
So was it having done all these recordings, you started to understand more of the industry as far as arrangements, as far as maybe even recording techniques? I mean, the, the amount of experience that you guys were acquiring was... was, was well, we, we owned our, when, we, when we bought our own studio, we had to learn a lot of things. And, uh, Jimmy Johnson was a, a great sound engineer as well as a great rhythm and guitar player. And so Jimmy led, led us into that. And Jimmy was the one who told us, hey, man, we, get it, we need to get a publishing company. And the publishing company is how we got the studio. You know, we, every session we do, the artists would come in and they wouldn't quite have enough songs for their album. And so we'd say, well, we got one. Because we had writers who would say, write a song for Millie Jackson. And they'd write a song for Millie Jackson. And then the next one would write a song for whoever the next one is. And so we'd get songs on their albums. And back in those days, the album cuts, they all you know, they made the same. So business-wise, you decide... You're going to buy a studio. Yeah. What was this like now to take on this adventure? Well, we had to borrow money. Uh, Jerry Wexler through Atlantic Records lent us the money uh, to get the, the building I'm in right now uh, to buy the studio. And we all we did was buy the business. We didn't own the building at that time. And uh, he lent us the money to get started to buy, I think it was an A track, was the first motor track. Uh, anyway, it was four track when we went to eight track. Uh, we had to give him half of our publishing in our publishing company, and we had to work for reduced rates. You know, I mean, Wexler was a shrewd businessman himself, and so you couldn't help but learn just from experience of working with people like Gary Wexler and Tom Dow. Boy, this experience that you guys were getting as far as having now you have the studio you got to kind of wear a couple of hats now. Now you're wearing the hat of musician and you're wearing the hat of businessman and owner. Yeah, we the businessman hat, we didn't ever really do well. <laughs> we did the music part great, but the business part we didn't do as well. You're recording now. What is it about Muscle Shoals? I mean, and you're coming from Muscle Shoals Sound right now. What is it about Muscle Shoals that, that attracted this core of great, great music that continues to come out of this area you know i don't know it's i think we all have the, the same mindset we all are more interested in making great music and recording it than we are being famous or making a lot of money or anything it was the music was always first and there's a lot of other people who have that same mindset kelvin guitar players that influence you that you that you kind of learned from were there any Albums you were listening to specifically about guitar players that that you just felt that that was kind of how you thought. Yeah, you know, of course, it, from from sixty three, sixty four on, I was really hooked with music and listening to everything. But the one that really got my goat was uh, probably that John Mayall Blues Breakers album with with Clapton. Yeah, you know, and at the time, I, I didn't know anything about the blues. I really didn't. I mean, uh, but I would always look on the record to see who who wrote it. And it would say, you know, McKinley Morgan or Chester Burnett. Or, and I still didn't know. But when years later, I realized it was, you know, Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf, you know, and that the English were just taking the blues and doing their own thing with it. So with that being said, I'd have to credit the Brits for – Bringing the blues back to America, you know. <laughs> well, they sure did. And, and the whole 60s British invasion was them delivering our music back to us. Absolutely. You Absolutely. know, I mean, you, you you talk about Little Richard. I mean, I've seen interviews with all those guys and the Little Richard's at the top of their list, you know. So as an influence, you know, it's usually Chuck, Richard and Elvis are the big yeah. three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Dave, who would you say are there bass players that you look up to that you uh, admire? Or well, uh, the usual group: uh, uh, Doug Dunn, James Jamerson, uh, Paul McCartney. Uh, you know, there's both sides. You know, the the R and B side and the rock side. Yeah. And I, I really studied those their records and and thought, well, ah, oh, that's what they're doing. They're doing one thing on the verse and doing something else on the chorus and. I, I learned by listening. Well, it's amazing how you guys really kind of immortalized this this area and 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 the swampers, and you really kind of 
put this together. If you if you went back, I'll start with Kelvin. If you went back, what would you say to a young Kelvin now with your experience? What would you have told yourself at a younger age that this was going to be happening? All I ever really want to do is play music and see the world. You know, money, was, if you got paid, great. You know, but I was a big music guy. I always read the, the album liners. Wanted to know where the album was cut, who was playing on it. What, you know, the whole deal, you know. And, you know, these guys were on a lot of the stuff. I didn't really know anything about Muscle Shoals. I just knew who these guys were and how great their records sounded and the songs were great. And Or, I mean, who would ever thought... I listened to Little Richard a little bit back in the day, and I wasn't a fanatic about it or anything, but whoever thought I would be his lead guitar player for almost 20 years? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just crazy. You know, like one day I'm laying on the couch half asleep, and Spooner Oldham's wife calls me. This is like in 2010. One of my bandmates had passed away, and so that was the kind of the end of that. So I'm like, what am I going to do, you know? Well, she calls, and it turns out, of course, Spooner had played with Neil Young and his Neil's wife, then wife, Peggy, who recently passed away. But Peggy had her own band. I didn't know anything about it, really. I, I had no idea that she was even a musician. <laughs> but their guitar, they were rehearsing a tour, and their guitar player had some sort of a meltdown. And so Spooner's never recommended anybody for a band because he always says, well, I don't want to get yelled at if it don't work out. You know? <laughs> you know? yeah. So, but Spooner's wife had recommended me and he was like, yeah, you know, so he told Peggy and then I guess they went on the internet, but the next day I was at Neil Young's ranch, you know? So uh, I ended up playing with Peggy up until the time she passed away, you know, did four records with her and it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. You could so you probably could not even ever have imagined for this to happen. No, no. You just follow the. In my case, I just follow the music. I have to do what feels right to me. You know. And uh, as far as giving advice to young musicians, my son is a musician. He's in a group called the Drive By Truckers, and they. I tried my best to keep him from doing that. My ex father in law passed away and left him money to go to college with. And he did about two months of college and said, no, this ain't working. And went and bought amplifiers and guitars. No say in the matter. Unbelievable. So when you think about it, you guys really have opened up some doors and opportunities for people to think about, boy, you can really live your passion if you believe it enough. Yeah. I think the de determination is, is a key factor. You know, everybody has insecurities and, you know, uh, well, he's better than me or his song's better than mine or he looks better than me or, you know, but yeah, determination is a big thing, you know. What motivates you? I'll start with David. David, what motivates you? What 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 drives you up, you know, to, to give you the fuel to want to get up every day and just kind of be involved with music? What's that force? <laughs> well, I've always loved music. Way before I played, I always loved listening to music and uh, reading the liner notes and all that. And so when I got a chance to play on a record, I was hooked for it. I was really hooked. And it was not the money. It was it's getting, like a drug. It's, it's <laughs> like it's getting to hear myself on, coming out of those speakers. And uh, that I thought, I've got to do more of this. And I, each time I hear myself, I think, well, I can do better. Right. I can get, make it sound better if I do such and such. And I, I learn through experience. I don't really know what I tell a young musician because you've got to want it so badly yeah. that nothing else matters. Right. Kelvin, what motivates you? What drives you? Well, the same thing. I mean, it's a uh, music is a part of it's like water. It's like blood. It's like it's just a part of me. I mean, when I'm if I have a guitar and I've got that piece of wood up against my belly and it just feels natural, you know. Yeah, yeah, you get tired, you get ear fatigue because you hear songs over and over and over, and you kind of, you know, you're just like, wow, I need a day to decompress. But I've always, I'm already always ready to play studio, live, front porch, whatever. You know, we have to balance our artistic side with the business side, you know, so you can have that, so you can be able to be financially support yourself to do what you love doing. But also a part of that is the family aspect. How, how, how have you balanced 
your artistic talent, your family, and your business? That's hard. I'm, I'm on my second marriage. I've got two children from my first marriage, and uh, my, I'm only 20 years older than my son. And uh, so we're more like brothers than we are like father-son thing. Uh, my first marriage broke up because she didn't want to share me with my world of music. And I wasn't ready. I, I wouldn't compromise. I stayed in there a long time. But finally, I said, this is it. And uh, I'm now married to a woman who does like what I do and is proud of what I do. And uh, I'm very happy. It makes a big difference. Beautiful. Kelvin, yourself, too. How, how, have you, how have you balanced all of it? Well, it's not easy. I mean, it takes a special person to to stay with a, a musician. You know, <laughs> uh, myself personally, I mean, I take marriage vows seriously when you stand up there and go for better or for worse. And and they knew <laughs> that I was a musician from the get go. So uh, luckily, uh, you know, I'm on number two now for this is 30 years that me and my wife have been together. So. And she's kind of in the what well, she is in the entertainment industry as well. You know, she's more involved in the movie side of the entertainment business. But it does take a special person to put up with it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if we, if we look back at the intensity of what you guys continue to do, and the balance of what it takes to be in this crazy music industry, and to continue in this industry, the artists that you have played for, that you have recorded with are literally a list of the greatest artists that have given us music for all of these years, but you continue doing it. So what's the force you're continuing? What's the next step? What do you see yourself that you want to continue doing? You know, I want to, I want to just keep doing the same thing I've been doing until I just fall out on the stage one day and they can do whatever they want after that. But I mean, you look at uh, Richard, little Richard, uh, Chuck Berry, Chuck Berry was, you know, 88, 89 years old. It's just the passion for playing, you know. Well, I think that sums it up right there. The passion for playing, you gentlemen have totally. You know, nothing's better than when you're playing and, and seeing some audience members really being touched by what you're doing, you know, or whatever. You know, it's making them happy. That's if it, even if it's just one person for me. It was a good night, you know. <laughs> well, the passion for playing totally is something which I think you both embody so well. And I think something that you do, which is so beautiful, is that you inspire people to aspire. Through your music and through your effort, you are inspiring people to then take their lives and lift it because of the great music you've delivered and the way you guys have led your lives by continuing to live your passion every day. Yeah, you can't compromise. You got you got to be true to yourself and your and your passion. Well, I think you both are incredibly true to yourself and to your passion. I thank you so much. And we have these interviews for the purpose of being able to capture this history so this young generation can research and listen and be involved in what came before them so they can stand on the shoulders of giants. Gentlemen, you are two of the biggest giants in our industry. And boy, oh boy, those are fantastic shoulders to stand on. So I thank you so much for all that you have done and what you continue to do on behalf of the Artist Series. Thank you, gentlemen, so much. I look forward at some point to getting down to Muscle Shows and being yes, used to the first. Yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, come on down. We'd love to. you got to have a slaw dog. <laughs> I would love to, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you, Dom. Dom Famular here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.